to let go is to no longer use the past to hurt us in the present. And that's what forgiveness is. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we cover releasing our expectations of who we think we should be and learning to accept and love ourselves unconditionally. So essentially, we're talking about becoming aware of our own domestication, like the many ways we've conditioned ourselves or are stuck in our limited programming and how to heal from it. Our guest today is Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. is a Nagual, a Toltec master of transformation. He is a direct descendant of the Toltecs of the Eagle Knight lineage and is the son of Don Miguel Ruiz, author of New York Times bestseller, The Four Agreements. By combining the wisdom of his family's traditions with the knowledge gained from its own personal journey, he now helps others realize their own path to personal freedom. Hello, Miguel. Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm doing good, Ian. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It's such an honor. And yes, I'm doing good. How are you doing? How's everything? I'm good. No, I. it's such an honor for me to have you on the podcast. I actually had your brother not too long ago on the podcast. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and of course, I've read like a lot of like the books from your father, and I am a big fan. Oh, so you. why don't you start by telling us your story and why you feel so passionate about helping people heal? The first of my story is that, you know, I'm the eldest son of Don Miguel Ruiz, and I got to witness Dr. Miguel Ruiz, Apprentice Miguel Ruiz, and then Don Miguel Ruiz. I, I, I got to live through the phases of his journey. And for me, I was like, I grew up in, with a lot of juxtaposition and contrast. Like, uh, I lived in in San Diego, California, and well, Chula Vista, National City area. But I went to school in Tijuana. I also lived in Tijuana for, for a good spell of years. So I was always living uh, between the United States and Mexico. So I have that contrast right there. My grandmother was a faith healer, uh, what they say, a curandera. And my father uh, was a general surgeon, a neurosurgeon, and a therapist. And my mother was a dentist. And my uncle is an oncologist. My other uncle is a neurologist. My aunt is a psychologist. So a There's lot a lot of doctors. doctors a mm. lot of doctors on my my mother's side. No, in fact, my father's side. Sorry, and my grandmother. Their all their mothers <laughs> is a faith healer. So you have right there a contrast. A a, a healer of the traditions of our ancestors, a curandera, and then all uh, her youngest kids are doctors and uh, medical doctors. That's the uncles I grew up with. So. Right off the bat, there's a contrast in styles of medication and healing. My grandmother would send some of her patients over to my my father and uncles, and in turn, they also sent their patients over to my grandmother. So it was was always this kind of uh, uh, view of like, whatever it is that you need to, to take care of yourself, that's the instrument. Like, don't narrow yourself down to one. It has to be this way. You look at the plethora of what we have, and we use that. As well as uh, I grew up uh, in the academics, you know, I went to school for the International Baccalaureate in my high school years. So I was heavily into the academics. And then you have spirituality at home. So there's another duality or juxtaposition. And I was uh, an apprentice to my family at the age of 14. Um, My brother and I got initiated when I was 14 years old. And my brother was 12 or 11 years old. Uh, my father uh, took us to Madre Grande one day. That my my Jose, my, my brother was gonna, my dad was going to take us to Disneyland that day. But Jose says, "Can we go to Madre Grande, which is the place where my grandmother usually does? It's uh, it's up in the hills out on the Dulzura, just east of San Diego, in, in the hills up there. And for some reason, Jose wanted to go. So my dad just saw that as like a a, a sign of a power sign, where like okay, it's time to initiate him. So. He took us up to a place called Madre Grande, like I said before. And we went up the hill, which is all in the east county of San Diego. All the mountains are are saturated by giant boulders, huge, big boulders. So we're walking up this little path surrounded by all these boulders. And we find ourselves in this little cave, a cave that's made by four boulders, just creating this little cave. And... 
that's where my father sits us down and we does the initiation, which is he, we gives, he gives us all seven stones, he ref, each uh, five of them reflecting the agreements, and the last two representing death and life. And when we finish the, 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 the initiation, my father goes up to the beginning of that opening of the, of the little cave, the stone-made cave, and you can see the silhouette on the floor. And my dad puts his head over his, like his hands over his head and starts uh, waving it back and forth as if it was a snake. And he begins to do that little dance and the shadow just started moving like a snake. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, the whole valley, you can hear the sounds of rattlesnakes just rattling. And we're like, me and Jose would just look at each other going, just kind of just very nervous. And my dad says, okay, your initiation starts now. You walked up, but now you're going to walk down by yourselves. You know that what's out there. You know there are snakes. But don't let fear stop you from going home. So he walks off. And me and Jose are like, all right. When we were going up, we would just be just walking around, just aimlessly putting our hands where we shouldn't have. Now we, now that we think about it, we shouldn't have put our hands there. And just nonchalant, uh, happy-go-lucky, uh, willy-nilly, walking up the, uh, the hill. But as we uh, got out of the cave, now we're a lot more cautious. We're holding each other's hands and we're walking slowly down the hill. And it's our first initiation to facing our fear, you know, the, the fear that we project onto the world. And breaking through that barrier, breaking through that veil of the irrational fear that's combined with real fear. So that's the beginning of my of our journey, the facing fear and letting us know that we can transcend it, we can engage it. Fear, the function of fear is to keep us safe. So it's an ally. But when we abuse fear, like we abuse alcohol and drugs, it's the thing that keeps us stuck in life and we would not live or make a choice if we let irrational fear creep into our life. So that was the whole task, to learn how to keep moving and let life teach us and guide us the way. At that point, my father says, good, once we've reached the bottom. Miguel, you're going to be apprenticing your grandmother, and you're going to help her translate everything into English, because she spoke nothing but Spanish. So I apprenticed with my grandmother for 10 years. And I learned how to meditate, I learned how to pray, I learned how all these uh, traditions uh, that she has been sharing and giving, but mostly healing. We heal with our own permission. We heal with our ability to engage. So in helping my grandmother help so many people throughout all these years, I've learned that we heal with our permission. And my grandmother was the instrument by which people healed, just like my uncles and my father were as doctors. And then my father, when I graduated college, because that's when he told me, like, he'll intensify my training once I graduate college. He really began to be more, not, not just diligent, but more ruthless with the teaching. And that's when I re began to see things in a totally different way become alive, face death by learning how to become alive, face fear that way. So I had this moment of clarity where I became aware of all our teachings and I felt in such a peace with myself in a power journey to Teotihuacan where every, I saw everything as beautiful. Like uh, my father would call it the, the breaking the, the assemblage point where all of a sudden you let go of the filter that blinds you, that distorts how you see the world. And you see life as is, which is beautiful. And I felt this enormous peace in one of these ceremonies. And then I would go home. And my mind was still thought I was up here. You know, I, I, I came home and I was at peace with so many things. But as time progressed, things began to change. And even though I thought I was here, my belief system just started taking me down, 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 down until I completely broke apart. Like my father had a, a massive heart attack. 
Uh, I lost some someone I loved very much. And then the biggest break, heartbreak of all was I wasn't who I pretended to be. And everything broke. And at that moment, I was about 26, 27 years old at this point. 26, actually. And I picked up the book, The Four Agreements, for the first time. Now, I had picked it up before. I bought the book when it first came out when I was 21 years old. I bought the book in Berkeley, California. And I began to read it. And around page three, I put the book down because it was my dad telling me what to do all over again. It's mm-hmm. one of the things that happens when you grow up in a family like this. Yeah. As a kid, we basically perceive it as my father's telling me what to do all over again. And I love my grandmother and I listened to the teachings, but I had I understood it conceptually or intellectually, but I hadn't had the aha moment with it yet until that moment where I realized I I I needed help. I needed to heal myself. I, I really just because you were born into this family doesn't mean you're not gonna hit rock bottom. You're gonna hit it. In fact, that's the whole point. You hit that rock bottom at that moment of clarity. And you decide to make a shift. You know, like I say in my book, The Mastery of Self, a moment of clarity without any action is just a thought that passes in the wind, but a moment of clarity followed by action becomes a pivotal moment in our life. So it's a moment in my life where I picked up the four agreements again and read it the way everyone has read it, sees it, which is I, I, I'm using it to help myself. And that's when I began to apply all everything my grandmother taught me, everything my father taught me to heal, to let go, to give myself the permission. For example, uh, up until that point, uh, every relationship I was in when we broke up, what I was taught by my friends was to, uh, as soon as, well, the best way to uh, heal from a breakup is to get into a new relationship, right? And uh, I believe that when I was young and all that did was create a freight train of stuff that I hadn't dealt with, processed or engaged. It's just, it just built up and built up and bitch. And imagine a, a freight train that with every new relationship, you just add more or another a caboose, another, another little cart to it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just adding to the bulk. And then one day it just comes crashing down. So I, part of the healing was take some time off from dating anyone giving myself time to heal and honor myself. This hurts. This is terrible. This is, and really begin to acknowledge myself, you know, kind of like a a drug addict or alcoholic that goes to a a meeting and says, hello, my name is so-and-so and and I'm an alcoholic uh, or I do drugs. For me, it's hello. My name is Miguel Ruiz Jr. And I do take things personal. I do make assumptions. Sometimes I'm not impeccable with the word. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I'm not skeptical at all. I buy hook, line, and sinker, and sometimes I don't do my best. Just ask my wife. She is my witness. Yeah. It's the moment where I stop pretending to be something I am not. And in order to heal, it starts with acknowledging and honoring yourself. It's basically the basis of unconditional love. You see, conditional love only sees what it wants to see. And unconditional love is seeing life as a whole, is seeing the whole yin and yang. And that's when I began to really begin to apply the teachings. And my father needed help. So I helped him because of his heart heart attack. You know, he didn't have enough energy to finish a class. So I would go up there and help him. You know, he would give me that look and I would go up and talk. And then I look back and he not, yes, I can I can start or no, give me more, more time. And that's how I began. So when I first started teaching. I was like a cover band, you know, uh, <laughs> covering the classics, covering yeah. the four agreements yeah. and repeating what I had learned from my grandmother and grand and my father. And then little by little, as life began to teach me, I began to add my own stuff. And that's when I, I stopped being a cover band and I started teaching how I inter- understood and interpreted the teachings. At this point, I had started dating again. I met my wife uh, now of 20 years now. And I did this all this journey to process of healing. And that's when I became aware, like the really understood the whole, we heal with our own permission. It's something my grandmother taught, taught me. It was like, in order, let me put it this way. Jose, my brother, as you, as you was in your show, says, has a beautiful quote. 
In the Toltec tradition, there's nothing to learn but to unlearn. I love that phrase. So for me, I go, well, what do I unlearn? And the answer was anything that stops me from giving myself the permission to heal. And that's it. That's that's the part where I, I had that aha moment and I kept moving forward. So that's where I became aware that the job I do is to help people heal from the wounds that conditional love left in their hearts and minds through the form of their domestication or conditioning. And that's what I do. So for me, that's the healing I give. I don't heal physically like my fathers and my uncles. I don't heal like a, a faith healer like my grandmother. I heal in my own unique way by being a mirror and reflecting a story that helped me heal. And if it resonates with you, it might help you as well. All right, time for a break for today's sponsor, Shopify. We've been using Shopify to host the Lavender Shop for the past six years. Before Shopify, I struggled with a clunky app on my blog that just didn't cut it for selling my products like the Artist of Life workbook. But switching to Shopify transformed everything. It's incredibly easy to customize your shop, navigate the platform, and access all the data you need through a seamless dashboard. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business with their all-in-one e-commerce platform. With Shopify, the checkout process is super smooth making it easier for customers to buy what they love without hassle. I'm grateful to have a platform where I can reach customers worldwide with the most efficient tools available. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash TLL, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash TLL to upgrade your selling today. That's shopify.com slash TLL. Thanks for sharing your story. I have so many questions to follow up with that. I mean, first of all, I think it's, it's interesting how when you you grow up with this, with these teachings, it's still possible for you, obviously you and your brother to, to go astray in your own ways. When you guys are like, you know, obviously in a family, you love each other. Do, do members of the family try to guide you or do they kind of let you guys go on your path? (laughs) Right. Cause this is something that you have to it's your own path. No, that's a great question. Right. Yeah. I'm just curious how it works. I can, I, as a father, I'll answer it as, uh, as best I can to like combine the two. Being my father's eldest, I got to witness uh, Dr. Miguel Ruiz, Apprentice Miguel Ruiz, and Don Miguel Ruiz. All right. Dr. Miguel Ruiz required you to have straight A's. You know, great, great. You know, that's, it's, it was definitely like, yeah, you straight still, to the point. Yep. You know, he shared what he knew, like the condition, the condition in the domestic. But as he began to do his own journey and undomesticate himself, uh, let go of conditional love, uh, apprentice Miguel Ruiz is a combination of both, a combination of requiring this, but he's learning to undo that. So there's a, that element of like letting me figure it out for myself. Kind of like when I became uh, an apprentice to my grandmother. All right, you, this is what you're going to do, and this is the rule. There it is. You know, it's like that's a little bit of doc, Dr. Miguel Ruiz there. And it works, you know, because I got straight A's. I, I got uh, a good scholarship or a grant for UCSD, and I, and I really did pretty good with my academics with that sort. I, I, I was a pretty good student and international baccalaureate and all that. It worked. But Dr. Don Miguel Ruiz... Now, he taught differently than his previous versions as a father. Don Miguel Ruiz was more of a license fair. Uh, if you wanted to learn how to swim, he would push you into the pool and pop, pop, pop. I, dad, I can't swim. Miguel, swim. But dad, I can't swim. Yeah, Miguel, swim. But dad, I, Miguel, your head's above water. You're swimming. I'm doggy paddling, but I'm like, he's right. My head's above water. I am actually doing it. I'm like, oh. And now I am doggy paddling everywhere. I'm like, oh, this is, okay. It's not the graceful thing that I thought it was supposed to be. It was like, all right. So he teaches us that way. He sets up a situation and lets us figure it out. Like, for example, with my education, in Mexico, you're only obligated to go to school to uh, eighth grade. That's by law. High school education, it's not mandatory, which means that in order to go to high school, you have to apply and do an entry exam. Like the way you uh, uh, take an exam to go to college and get admitted to a college, 
in Mexico, you have to take an entry exam to be accepted to high schools. That's how you get in. If you don't get, if you don't pass that, you're not getting into the high school. So that's that's the system. So my father at that point says, "Okay, Miguel, your education is now your own. You are responsible for it. To, for you, you will learn what kind of life you want based on the actions you take. If you want to go to high school." Go to the school and find out what they need in order to get enrolled. And that's what I did. I went to the schools and I applied and I got into Preparatoria Lázaro Cárdenas. That's the name of the school, the Lázaro Cárdenas uh, Federal uh, High School Preparatoria. And I discovered the International Baccalaureate, the IB program, and I, I enrolled for that and I tested for that. Then I got in and I realized it's my own destiny, if that's what I want. And then I learned that the rest of my life. I, if I wanted to go to college, if I wanted to do SAT, I would do it myself. That kind of self-reliance. And the fact that I was taking care of my grandmother, like uh, being an apprentice where like, part of me was like this caregiver that I, want, I had a lot of responsibility right off the bat. So it was one of those things that he taught me how to trust myself into making choices. And if a choice doesn't work, just to quote him, like a quote from him would be this. There's no such thing as a good or bad choice. There's other choice that you like and that, uh, with a consequence that you like, sorry, or a choice with a consequence that you don't like. A consequence is not good or bad, not wrong. It's not a punishment as most people associate the word a consequence with. A consequence is the result of the action you take. What kind of consequence do you want to experience? So from that point of view, if you like the consequence, enjoy it. If you don't like the consequence of your choice, don't let personal importance stop you from correcting it. Don't let your ego stop you from correcting it. My friend, Heather Ashamara, she's a, she co-wrote a book with me, uh, The Seven Secrets of Happy, Healthy Relationships. And she has for a lot of her own books, uh, Warrior Goddess uh, Training and things like that. Uh, she has an analogy that describes that pretty good. Imagine a heat-seeking missile. A heat-seeking missile is only correct 1% of the time. The rest of the time, it's correcting, correcting, correcting. It's always correcting its course, trying to hit that heat signature. So imagine a heat-seeking missile with personal importance or ego and says, I am a heat-seeking missile and I'm supposed to hit it right off the bat, 100% of the time. Well, if it needs to correct, but it has that idea that it has to get it in the first try, it won't correct because the ego won't let him. So imagine that with us, not correcting our course because our image of self says, I need to get it perfect right off the bat, get it right. And that's where personal importance comes in. Basically, my father taught us to learn from our mistakes, to learn from the consequences of our actions. So as a father now, how would I apply that with my son, my son and my daughter? My son has autism, so I have to really have a totally different, reinvent the whole thing. Like the ABA therapist taught me quite a, how to be uh, and how to raise my son from that point of view. And then I have my daughter. And she's pretty much that ap approach that like we let her figure things out. Of course, we nudge her here and there. And my wife is a disciplinarian, and she and I have the same agreement. She would tell the kids, if you do this, this is the consequence. If you do that, this is a consequence. Which kind of consequence do you want? So that's the way we were raised. But in contrast, you know, the, the main problem that the four agreements addresses is something like called domestication. A system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an, an individual, where if we live up to the expectation, we're worthy of a reward. And since we are emotional beings, that reward feels like acceptance, which feels like love. And we, when we don't live up to an expectation, then we're worthy of the punishment. And the punishment feels like rejection or a lack of their love. It's the way we learn conditional love. I love myself if I live up to my expectation. And that's the problem that the four agreements in every single one of our books addresses in different ways and facets. So you can say, for example, take me. 
Hello, my name is Don Miguel Rich Jr. I don't take things personal. I don't make assumptions. I always do my best. <gasps> I forgot the other agreement. Oh, no. How can I call myself Don Miguel Rich Jr. if I don't know the four agreements? And there is a diatribe for punishing myself for not right. living up to that image of perfection that is Don Miguel Rich Jr. who doesn't take things personal, doesn't make assumptions, always does his best, and he's impeccable with his word. Thank you very much. If I live up to that image of perfection, then I'm worthy of the name Don Miguel Rich Jr. I'm worthy of the, of being a Toltec. But if I fall short again, like forgetting the fifth agreement, be skeptical, there's a tra- diatribe punishing myself for not living up to that image. And that's the motivator most of us do. We have to live up to an expectation. If we want to live up to the family name, if we want to live up to this expectation or whatever image someone has of us, then we forsake ourselves and pretend to be something we're not in order to achieve that agreement or condition in this case. So in this, in this example, I use the four agreements. The telltale sign that we use the four agreements as an instrument of domestication is judging ourselves for taking things personal, judging ourselves for the rest of it. And at that moment, we corrupted the four agreements and turned it into the four conditions of our personal freedom. We call it the four agreements, but it's it's a complete corruption. Now we're using it as an instrument of conditioning or domestication. And we still think we're practicing the four agreements, but we're practicing the four conditions. I love myself if I live up to it. As soon as I practice the four agreements, then my life will be better. But that's the corruption. And I became aware of that. I became aware of that when, when the previous com- answer, when I was telling you about how I began to heal myself in that. Uh, uh, my biggest heartbreak was pretending to be something I am not, is that I realized that I corrupted this tradition, and just as I corrupted so many things, and trying to live up to an image that doesn't exist. It's kind of like, for example, since Jose was in your show, let's say that to to be perfect is to be 100% completely free of any flaw. Well, let's say that my mind says, in order to be perfect, I have to weigh 170 pounds, look the way I look when I was 27 and have hair like Don Jose Luis Ruiz, (laughs) who has beautiful (laughs) hair, beautiful hair. But I look at myself in the mirror and that's just not the truth. I'm 48 years old. I weigh 188 pounds. And this is the truth of my hair. And because I'm going to live up to that image of perfection, I'm going to castigate myself when I look at myself in the mirror. You fat, you (laughs) ball fat, you all ball fat. Whenever, if we look at ourselves in a mirror and we feel the sting of that judgment, we're punishing ourselves for an image that doesn't exist, that we're comparing ourselves to. And that's what domestication is. That sting that we see ourselves in the mirror, whenever we see ourselves and we judge ourselves for the way we look or what we don't have, that's conditioning, that's domestication. Let's take another quick break to talk about our sponsor, Honey Love. Wedding season is upon us, and whether you're attending as a guest, standing by the bride, or just stepping out in style for an evening, Honey Love has you covered. What I love about Honey Love is how their shapewear makes me feel. The Superpower Short, for instance, uses targeted compression to enhance your curves without squeezing them. It's designed to make you feel hugged, not suffocated. Plus, the breathable fabric and flexible boning ensure that I can move freely, no rolling down, no discomfort. Honey Love isn't just for special occasions. Their pieces are perfect for any time you want to add a little extra confidence to your outfit. From supportive bras to their superpower short that lifts and sculpts, Honey Love makes it easy to feel great every day. If you're ready to boost your wardrobe and confidence, check out Honey Love. Treat yourself to the best shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash TLL. Use our exclusive link, honeylove.com slash TLL to get your discount of 20% off. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them so please support our show and tell them we sent you. Say yes to every adventure with Honey Love. How do we let go of that conditioning? Because a lot of us are stuck in that box of these expectations. A moment of clarity comes in. It's like the moment you become aware that you're doing it. It's kind of like an alcoholic, uh, a drug addict that has a moment of clarity. It's like you come out of a bender and you have this huge hangover. My dad calls it the minimum opportunity, you know, and drug addiction, alcoholism, they call it uh, a moment of clarity. It's the moment where you realize what you've done and what you've created. It's like you're waking up from the stupor of the bender and you see the truth of what you've done, but you have this hangover 
And you know that if you take a open up a bottle of beer or take a shot of tequila, the hangover will go away because it's the hair of the dog. That's the popular expression. And you're punting the problem for another day. But in that moment of clarity, you can make a different choice. If you see what you're doing, that's the moment when you take the step in a different direction and you say, no, I don't want to continue with this. I will start letting go of it. And the first step is letting go and be able to detox, which is painful and just let the hangover come. And that's a very dangerous position to some of us. But it is the step that allows us to heal. So to let go of domestication, or in this case, conditional love, starts by acknowledging, this is my truth. I, Miguel Ruiz Jr., do take things personal. I make assumptions. Sometimes I don't do my best. Someone, sometimes I take it personal. And to this very day, like out of all the five agreements, that one's the one that I still work with. That's the one that keeps changing. You know, just as soon as I thought I mastered it, I have teenagers and I have to start all over again. You <laughs> oh, know, wow. That type of thing. But mm-hmm. it starts with that moment of acknowledgement. A teacher in Sacramento taught me this lesson. Forgiveness is the moment you no longer wish the past was any different. It is the moment you accept it and you let it go. I think that's a beautiful way to describe what forgiveness is. It's a moment that you realize that you can't go back in the past. You can't go back there and change a yes to a no, no to yes, because life no longer lives in the past. The past only exists in the mind as a form of a memory. And it probably didn't happen the way we think it happened. And it's the same with the future. The future, the future doesn't exist yet. It only exists in our mind as our imagination. Both the future and the past no longer exist. The only place that exists is this present moment. This present moment is the only thing that exists. It's the place where I'm able to make a choice. I can't tell you what kind of choice I'm going to make in the future because I have no idea where I'm going to be at at that day. But I do know where I was back then. And to accept it is the moment we realize it happened and I can't change it. It happened. So the moment you no longer wish the past was any different is the moment you accepted that not only it happened, but it brought me here. To let go, my brother Jose has this beautiful analogy. Imagine a scorpion that sings itself over and over again, administering to itself the emotional poison that it meant for someone else. And every time it stings itself time and time again, until that day that comes when the scorpion decides to no longer sting itself, that's letting go. Mm-hmm. And someone once says, scorpions don't do that. They don't sting themselves. One person did say that they, they did. So the rest of them said no, but one person did. And I said, yes, of course. They don't. But we humans do. Every time we think of the past, we punish ourselves over and over again, administering that emotional poison that we meant for someone else to ourselves. Por mi culpa, por mi culpa, por mi culpa. And we're punishing ourselves time and time again. To let go is to no longer use the past to hurt us in the present. And that's what forgiveness is. The best way to let go of conditional love, of conditioning, of domestication, is to forgive ourselves for ever saying yes to it in the first place. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite quotes comes from Eleanor Roosevelt. She says, No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Let me paraphrase that a couple of times. No one can make me feel inferior without my consent. No one can domesticate me without my consent. How do I give consent? By believing it, by saying yes to it. And that's how we get domesticated. Someone domesticated us ever so long ago. And the reason why it continues to impact us is because we continue to believe it. We continue to say yes to it. Someone might have judged us when we were teenagers, when we were young, an ex, boyfriend, girlfriend, a friend, TV, MTV back in the day for me, <laughs> uh, YouTube channel nowadays, whatever it is, a meme. If it impacted you in that negative way, forgive yourself for ever saying yes to it in the first place. For, forgive yourself for letting someone else's prejudice dictate who you're supposed to be that's the beginning Mm. practice is that every time life gives you the chance to make a different choice you do so it's kind of like the don't let like my dad was saying there's no such thing as a bad or good or bad choice just just a choice 
you either like it or don't. So it's basically practicing. Let's take the four agreements, for example. I already said that that's, uh, taking things personal is the one that I still work with. Okay, it starts with me. I take things personal. Yep. I stop pretending to be something I'm not and I accept myself. I take it personal and that's okay. And in modern terms, I would be like acknowledging my shadow self and I am that shadow. Yeah. That's me. I own it. Own my own choices. Own my own actions. Own my own consequences. I own it. It's not, it's not gaslighting. It is me taking back my power. Mm-hmm. I said yes, but I read the book. I understand what not taking things personal is, which to me is to recognize that I only control to the tips of my fingers. I don't control beyond it. I only control my will. I only control my perception. My wife, my family, my friends, the people I love, they control to the tips of their fingers. They don't control my will. They don't control my perception. I do. And in turn, I don't control their will or perception. They do. I only control to the tips of my fingers. So for me, taking things personal is assuming responsibility for someone else's will or perception. To not take it personal is to no longer take responsibility for someone else's will or perception. It's their way of seeing things. Right. All right. So I started. I I accept that I take things personal. I accept and I understand. And the funny thing is my dad taught me how I take things personal. He was talking about how teaching. One day, him and I are are, um, giving a presentation in Rochester, New York, back in 2009. And our host puts us up in a very nice hotel in Rochester, New York. So when we finished the presentation and we we're kind of tired and in front of the lights, we're, we're, we're a bit sweaty because you sweat underneath the lights. We walk in and there's a restaurant where everyone's dressed very nice and elegant. And my father says, hey, let's go eat. And I said to my father, let's go upstairs and freshen up because I see that everyone's dressed nicely. And I'm not, I'm dressed up, but I'm not dressed nicely. I'm, I'm, I can feel the, the presentation we just gave. Let's go upstairs and freshen up so we can look presentable. That's what I said. And he says, okay. So we go upstairs. I go and I take a quick shower just to get rid of that film. And I'm preparing myself. I'm dressing myself up and I look good. I'm like, yes, that's me. I go down the elevator waiting for my dad and his girlfriend at the time. And they're not down. So I'm sitting there. I'm standing waiting and I'm dressed nice. They're dressed nice. I fit in. Perfect. I look good. Yes. Then all of a sudden, the elevator doors open and out comes my dad dressed in his pajamas. And I'm going, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> He's trying to teach me something. Yeah. And I start doing a little mantra to myself. Not going to bite. Not going to bite. Not going not gonna to give in. Not going to give in. So when he comes up and he says, is there something wrong? And I said, nope. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes. Okay, so let's start walking. And there is he's walking in front of me in his pajamas. And I'm walking behind him. I'm 30 somewhat years old. I'm 33 at this time, 33 years old. And he's making me feel like a teenager all over again. At least I tell him myself, he's making me feel like, no, I'm feeling it. I feel like a teenager. There's no dress code. People are dressed nice because they want to dress nice. There's no sign that says suit and tie, whatever. So when the hostess comes up and asks for table of three, like my dad says table of three, she says, no problem, walk this way. There's no problem. There's no qualm. But she decides to walk down the middle of the restaurant. And I'm walking behind them so I can see everyone turning their heads to look at him. And I can hear, what's he wearing? Oh, my gosh, look at this right back and I'm like really getting super self-conscious, like a statue of salt. I'm like, it becomes really hard to walk because I'm so embarrassed. When we get to the to the to the booth that uh, the hostess had chosen for us, my dad looks at me and says, "Is there a problem?" And I said, "Nope." <laughs> Are you sure? Yep. I'm still doing my mantra. Not gonna bite. Not gonna bite. Not gonna bite. I'm sit down. And my dad grabs this menu, and he forgot to bring his reading glasses. He, he put on his pajamas, but he didn't bring his reading glasses. So he's like this, and he's squinting. He's trying to... So his girlfriend lends him her glasses. Yeah. He puts it on, and there's different prescriptions. So his eyes kind of bug out, and I'm going, I roll my eyes like a teenager. My dad sees it, and he pounces. He goes, what's wrong? 
And I said, Papa, come on, this is this is a nice restaurant. People here are dressed nice. And here you are dressed in your pajamas. You look like an eccentric guy, like Howard Hughes or something. Papa, it's embarrassing. My dad looks me straight in the eye and he says, Miguel, do you disrespect me so much that you think you have to pay for me? That you don't think that I can pay for my own consequences myself, that you have to pay for me? Do you disrespect me that much? And with that, I'm like, oh, wow. I am. I'm a, it's, he's the one wearing the pajamas. Why am I mortified by his actions? And then I realized that part of my conditioning or domestication was birds of a feather fly together. I tell you who you are by who you hang out with. But the big one was whenever I was throwing a tantrum, in order for my mom to control me, to stop me to, from making a tantrum in public, she would say, look, Miguel, look, that boy, you see that boy over there? He's looking at you. Aren't you embarrassed? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Compose yourself so you don't look bad in front of him. And it tell you it worked because I see it, I look at the boy, and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm trying to control myself, and that's how she got me to stop me from throwing a tantrum. You can say that's the root. And it's a, such a root that as I grew older, you better not embarrass me. You better dress so cold so I don't want you making me look bad. And there's the trigger. There's the trigger that makes me take things personal. And it's the trigger that makes me domesticate someone else. Don't make me look bad or else. All this happened, all this realization happened as my dad says that. And I look at my dad and I says, Pop, you're right. Forgive me. I, I, I did take it personal. You're right. He said, good, let's keep eating. You know, let's go, let's, let's order. Because that's all he really cares about. He doesn't really care. So that's how we became aware that I take things personal, among other things in life. So, all right. It starts with accepting I take things personal. Then I read the book and I learned what not taking things personal is. So now I get to get to know myself. What triggers me to take things personal? Well, besides my dad wearing pajamas and um, other things in life, uh, there's people posting something on Facebook. All right. I can't control when my dad puts on pajamas or not. I can't really make him put a pajama every time we go to a restaurant in order for me to try this out again. So I log on to whatever social media. I scroll down, and there's the name of a person that usually makes me want to go, grr, things, someone that makes me take things personal. I scroll down a bit more. It's a doozy. At that moment, I've already accepted that I take things personal. I've accepted that I, Miguel Ruiz Jr., take things personal. Yeah, exactly. So at that moment, I log down. There's the name of the person. There's the, there's the post. And at that moment, I have a choice. If I take it personal, it's because I want to take it personal. Because I've already accepted that of me. I, Miguel Reese Jr., take things personal. And that's, that's what unconditional love is. Unconditional love except, is accepting the whole of who mm. I am. Yeah. And I've read the book. I read the concept. And I'm free to say yes to not taking it personal. That's what personal freedom is. I'm free to say yes to taking it personal and yes to not taking it personal. And with that awareness, I choose not to take it personal because I don't want the hangover that comes with taking it personal. And that's, that's how you begin to practice something. You practice it by recognizing one in yourself, the trigger. And once the tr when you recognize the trigger, when life is happening, you have a choice. You either give in to the, the trigger or you don't. The choice, the more you practice that, you get better and better. But it's all about recognizing it. So going back to the concept of how do we let go of con conditional love and domestication, it starts by first acknowledging this is who I am. Like conditional love only sees what it wants to see. It wants to see that image by which we model. Ego is easier to understand as a function rather than a concept. The function of ego is to protect the illusion. What is the illusion? The model by which we condition ourselves or domesticate ourselves, that image of selves that we think is deemed lovable and acceptable and whatever it is that we say it's perfect. The function of ego is to protect that, to accept ourselves. This is who I am. I, that's the moment where I, we break ego. Because we, we let go of that need to live up to an image that doesn't exist. And con unconditional love is the willingness to accept the whole of who I am, the whole yin and yang. 
So the more you practice it, the better you get at it. And that's where we're all at. It's like the fifth agreement is my favorite instrument to create a moment of clarity. And it's the moment you hold back your yes, you hold back your no, and you listen. When you listen, you're able to introduce scrutiny. But the thing is that you're already broke of cycle. The automatic yes and the automatic no, that, that habit that we create that makes us take things personal or make assumptions or condition ourselves automatically because we're so used to it, we're no longer thinking about it. It's an automatic reaction. But holding back that yes and no allows you to listen and give it scrutiny. If it survives your scrutiny, then you say yes. If it doesn't survive your scrutiny, then you'll say no. But that's what allows me to give uh, a moment of clarity, like the fifth agreement, uh, using doubt as an instrument to question all your beliefs. Is mm-hmm. it the truth? Yeah. Where did you learn it? Was it the truth ever? Yeah. And most importantly, how did it impact us? And that's it. But it starts with a willingness to see yourself, to acknowledge yourself, and most importantly, accept yourself. Let's take another quick break. Today's episode is brought to you by Lola V. With the weather getting cooler these days, it's crucial to protect our hair from dryness and breakage. That's why I'm excited to share about Lola V, the innovative hair care line by Jennifer Aniston. Since using Lola V, my hair feels healthier, smoother, and more vibrant. Their unique B Pro 3 bond technology, derived from chia seeds, is a naturally derived peptide bond builder clinically proven to prevent, protect, and repair hair from the signs of aging and damage, ensuring your hair stays resilient. I also recommend their exfoliate and detox scalp shampoo and intensive repair treatment for weekly care that truly transforms your hair's health. The cherry on top is that all their products use natural, plant-based ingredients free from harsh chemicals. Unlock Jennifer Aniston approved hair at lolav.com. As our loyal listeners, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use the code LAVENDER15 at checkout. That's 15% off your order at lolavie.com with promo code LAVENDER15. Please note you can only use one promo code per order and discounts can't be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. Your hair will thank you. Let me summarize because I think people might have gotten lost in the story, but I, I I love the the concept you're teaching and thank you for like giving us examples and going deep, but just this lesson that we have to learn to accept ourselves unconditionally, even the the bad parts that are still like you, because nobody's ever perfect. You might know all of these lessons, the four agreements, but it's hard to live them, right? So instead of feeling bad about not living up to your expectations of yourself, understand yes. that the the real goal is not to live perfectly. The real goal is to accept yourself as you are. Like accept that I'm not perfect. I don't always do this. I, I right. I don't always do my best. I don't always right. So it's all it is is like acceptance, right? Yeah. And the most important part is this: the reason why acceptance is so important is that when we want to heal, it starts by acknowledging this is how I feel. Yeah. Like I said before, like going back into the full circle, you know, in the Totec tradition, there's nothing to learn but to honor. Like my, my, my brother Jose Luis says, Don Jose, what should we unlearn? Anything that stops us from giving ourselves the permission to heal and acknowledging, like for example, PTSD. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've uh, spoken to firefighters, soldiers, police officers, gangsters, cholos, and and the one thing that all of them have in common, regardless of what side of the law you're in, none of them want to be the weak link, which means none of them want to acknowledge their PTSD because they don't want uh, someone to think less of them or to not trust them or whatever stigma that comes within that society. But in order to heal from post-traumatic stress disorder, it comes with acknowledgement, this is how I feel. So the cholo and the gangster has a lot of trauma just as much as a police officer, soldier, and firefighter because all like all of them are experiencing some, some very hard stuff in life and things that rattles the nerve. And if it goes unchecked, it could really begin to wreak havoc, not just in your personal life, but in your relationships and in the profession. Or, you know, but it starts with acknowledging letting go of that, which makes you think that you'll be less than. Is acknowledging this is how I feel. This is this is the the step I need to take, 
And it starts with, I, Miguel Ruiz, have PTSD. For example, I do. My, my son has autism. He's 19 years old. And we just went through a very difficult uh, period in our life. He's doing a lot better now, th- uh, thank God. But we went through a phase where we didn't know. Uh, and he, he was very uh, escalated very harshly. And I got a concussion from it and all that. But mm. I, de- uh, I, I developed something called uh, caregiver's fatigue. Yeah. You know, and that comes with uh, uh, some PTSD with itself. But if I let the image, I'm supposed to be Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. I'm not supposed to have PTSD. I'm not supposed to have any of that. I'm supposed to be a master of whatever it is I'm supposed to be a master of. Then I've already right there blocked myself from healing, blocked myself from taking the steps that allows me to heal. And yeah. I acknowledge I have PTSD from raising my son through a very difficult time in his life because he was not feeling good at all. He was going through uh, chronic pain, and the only way he let that pain out was through uh, escalations because he didn't have the voice or things. And there's compassion, of course, but I'm still human, and the trauma and the, the constant nerves and the anticipation, it just creates a lot of anxiety. It's there, so... I, uh, I've taken the steps to heal myself. I go to the Amen Clinic, and they've, a psychiatrist there has, uh, Dr. Mina has helped me quite a bit. I also see a therapist that's helped me talk through it. I, I apply my my uncle, my dad's teachings I by my grandma's, and I continue to believe what my grandma says. It doesn't have to be exactly this. As an instrument, as a human being, we use the full spectrum, and we use the thing that resonates with us in order to give ourselves the healing and with that, it starts with knowing yourself because in order for you to have something that resonates with you, you need to know yourself. You need to know who this person is. So it's not about I have to, but it's more of an I want to. Mm-hmm. I want to live. Yeah. To me, that's the motivator. I stopped drinking alcohol eight years ago because I have sleep apnea. And for me, the consequence of drinking anymore is no longer worth it because I, won't, I, I am, I'm risking a heart attack or a stroke, so I stopped drinking. It's, it's a very strong motivator. I am healing because uh, of the PTSD, because I, I want to continue to be a good father to my, my son and my daughter and, and a good husband to my wife. But most importantly, I want to have a good relationship with myself. I want to be here. And that starts with that acknowledgement. So for me, there are so many paths to healing. It could be uh, psychiatry and psychology. It could be retreats. My wife doesn't like uh, certain types of therapy, so she goes to to do breath work. She goes into does yoga. She does that community. She gets together and talks with her girlfriends and has girl talk. She's that kind of a person, and she's constantly working on herself in her own unique way, but it has to be in her way. And it's different with my daughter. My daughter finds someone who she talks to and she engages. And same thing with my son and same thing with me. We like, we all, all four of us have our own unique way of dealing with life, but it starts with acknowledging this is how I feel. And we're there to hold space for one another. But in order to hold space for one another, it's acknowledging where they're going in life, where they're at in life, acknowledging them for who they are as opposed to having an image of who they're supposed to be and locking them into that image and never seeing them for who they are. And if we don't see them for who they are, we'll never know what they really need to, not just to heal, but to enjoy life. And how can I help? Yeah. And that's the thing, but I can't give what I do not have. So it starts within myself. How, what kind of steps do I give myself to heal? I've let go of, of alcohol. I've, I've, I've worked, uh, I work out and run marathons and half marathons. I'm learning how to play the piano because I want to break through whatever cycle and, and, and use the, the flexibility, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for of the brain, the, uh, malleability, the, um, I'm forgetting the word, but anyways, (laughs) it's the ability to help heal the brain and learn how to play a piano and be able to do something new and learn a new language and, Take the time to do the work, you know, like in, like in Ted Lasso, when the guy who always gives Ted Lasso a hard time, and after he gives him a hard time, looks at human and says, do the work. It's, it's, it's worth it. Do the work. And that's it. You yeah. know, the mastery of self is the moment you stop pretending to be something you are not, and you accept yourself for who you are. 
and we put into practice everything we've learned. When life is good, we use everything we've learned to enjoy it, to be present. When things get tough or rough, or we go through a very hard patch in our life, we use everything we've learned to move the story forward. Mm. First, by acknowledging ourselves and taking those steps to heal. Because like the old saying goes, everything shall pass. George Harrison says, this too shall pass, you know? And it's one of those things that you go forth, you know, you move. So it's your, that's when you apply everything you've learned from every workshop, every book, every podcast, every lesson that you like, you've learned in your life. It's like a, an instrument that we use that when the life gives us the proper time to apply it, we apply it and we learn from it. And that's really it. Applying applying the instrument we, we learn and know which instrument's what. You know, it's kind of like the, Im- the image of a tool shed, you know. It's, uh, you won't use a hammer to put in a, 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 um, a screwdriver. You go in there and look for that right screwdriver up with a cross or a flathead and you look for the one that's appropriate and you use it but you always put you have to be able to recognize what instrument is adequate for what's in front of you what you're dealing with now so it's about practice practice makes the master the four agreements is an instrument that allows us to clean the channels of communication and give us the opportunity to heal from our own wounds. The four conditions, which is using the four agreements as an instrument of domestication, as an instrument to subjugate ourselves and to continue to pretend to be something we're not. And if you understand how we're doing that, we, we can see how we can corrupt Deepak Chopra, Marian Williamson, Jesus, Buddha, Siddhartha, Muhammad, psychology, psychiatry, and Alcoholics Anonymous. We're so used to corrupting beautiful traditions that allows us to accept ourselves unconditionally, to love ourselves unconditionally, but we're so used to domestication, we'll corrupt all of it. Yeah, we make everything rules instead of, like, this is, it, so many teachings show us the way, but people just take it as, I must live up to this exact standard, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if we use the, the, the same, that's a same uh, metaphor, there's, the, there's people out there teaching the four agreements as, as, a, as, as an instrument of, of healing, of personal freedom. And there's people teaching the four agreements as an instrument of domestication. And they're not really practicing the four agreements, they're practicing the four conditions, but they don't realize that. And because we're so used to that domestication or conditioning. And if we understand how we're doing that, we can see how we corrupted so many beautiful traditions. So that's where the fifth agreement, Jose's uh, fifth agreement, be skeptical, but learn to listen, comes in. And my dad's, of course, like that, but my, my dad, the original way I learned the fifth agreement was as a, on that day where we're back in the cave in Madre Grande, my father gave us three rules. The first rule, I'm, I'm going to be paraphrasing here. Miguel, first rule, don't believe me. <laughs> I said, done. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, something in what I say lies the truth. Don't believe me, but learn to listen. Listen to what I'm saying. You might be able to hear the truth in some some of the things I say, but you don't know where I learned it from. You don't know if I learned uh, fake news or distortion. You don't know if I learned the four conditions from a teacher who practiced the four conditions. But learn to listen. Somewhere in what I'm saying lies the truth. And if you understand that agreement, then you understand the second rule. Don't believe yourself. Because you don't know where you learned it from, but learn to listen. Somewhere in what you're saying lies the truth. And if you understand those two concepts, and the reason why you don't believe them is that you don't know where they learned it from, but give it scrutiny Mm -hmm. by learning to listen. Then the third rule is this. Don't believe anyone else, but learn to listen. Somewhere in what they're being said lies the truth. And the ability to discern it is important. Yeah. Like Neil deGrasse Tyson has this quote that I love. The truth exists whether you believe in it or not. That, well, the full quote is, the thing about science is that the truth exists whether you believe in it or not. Which to me, I come to interpret like, the truth exists with or without me. It doesn't need me for it to exist. The black hole was going to exist whether we prove this existence or not. Yeah. 
So the truth doesn't need humanity for it to exist. In contrast, though, and this is where I come in, a belief only exists for as long as you say yes to it. Yeah. The moment you change that yes into a no, it ceases to exist, which means mm. a belief needs me for it to exist. It doesn't exist somewhere out there. It only exists within me and the agreements we make. In humanity, the more, the more people believe it, the more it feels real. But the thing is, is that it's still an illusion because at any given moment, I can shift that yes into a no and it ceases to exist. And that's the difference between the truth and a belief. The truth exists whether you believe in it or not. It doesn't need you for it to exist. Thank you very much. But a belief does. It needs you. Mm -hmm. It only exists because you keep saying yes to it. And that's when I say the best way to let go of conditional love is to forgive yourself for ever saying yes to it in the first place. Because it only existed because you kept saying yes to it. But at any given moment, you can forgive yourself, change that yes into a no, and that condition that made you feel inferior, that made you feel like you weren't worthy of love, that you weren't made you feel like you weren't worthy of forgiveness, ceases to exist. And it no longer has power over you because you no longer believe it. Yeah. Love it. All right, Miguel, we're nearing the end of the podcast, but I really loved that last thing. It really hit home for me. If you have one final message that you want to leave with the listeners today, what would that be? Enjoy life. Enjoy being you. Enjoy the relationships you have. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful experience to be alive. Yes, there's a lot of darkness out there and a lot of hardships, a lot of things. But there's also a lot of light, a lot of a life. You are the constant in every relationship you are in. If there's disharmony within you, then there will be always disharmony in every relationship you're in because there's disharmony within you. But if you give yourself the permission to heal and bring that harmony within yourself, where you're comfortable being alone, enjoy being alone, because you recognize that you are the constant. Everyone in life comes and goes, but you are always with you. Then that peace comes in, and then you can share that. You can share that unconditional love with everyone else. So it's one of those things that I can't give what I do not have. So it starts within me. If you want to be the change you want to see in the world, it starts with me. So enjoy your life don't take things for granted don't take relationships for granted enjoy this beautiful opportunity that every relationship right now exists because you're both saying yes you're both choosing each other and that's beautiful but don't forget to choose yourself too take care of yourself protect yourself love yourself engage but at the same time take chances take a risk you never know when life says is willing to say yes to you. Life has every right to say no, just like you. Your no is just as powerful as your yes, but be willing to engage. Amazing. All right, where can we find you online? Well, online, uh, the whole family shares the same website, MiguelRuiz.com. I do have my website, MiguelRuizJr.com, which I acknowledge that needs a little bit more tender loving care <laughs> that's okay <laughs> but most of the time we are in social media uh, on facebook and instagram um i used uh i i still have something on x but i'm not that active in it um uh, and on tiktok too there's something there for me but i haven't been <laughs> i don't know how to log back into it that's, that's okay <laughs> <laughs> but i am uh, active on instagram and facebook so domigalreesjr.com uh uh, I guess that's Tommy Galvez Jr. on Instagram and social and and Facebook. Okay, amazing. I'll have all the links down below so listeners can learn more and check you out. Thank, Thank you, you so much for sharing your wisdom today. There was so much, so many gold nuggets in there that I like it just also brings me more at peace, reminding me to come back to unconditional love. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the opportunity and hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and congratulations on this wonderful podcast. Thank you. You too. Have a great day. You too. Have fun. Enjoy. Mm -hmm.